Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Welcome, everybody. It is a Music Monday special here on Big Blend Radio today. We always love new music, and we yeah. especially love it when we get to uh, bring John Durant back on the show. John has been on our show over the years uh, with his different albums. He is an incredible guitarist, and uh, he is on the show today with his friend and English keyboardist, Peter Silvers. And during the pandemic, they recorded two amazing instrumental EPs um, that go together. It's like a back-to-back. Um, and the first one that came out is Always Golden Sands, and the second one, and Always Golden Sands has three songs, and then we've also got This Can Get Them All Now. They're both out there. You can get them on Bandcamp, by the way, one of the better places to buy music for musicians. Um, it, they, they actually pay the musicians, just saying. Uh, but they're available on all streaming services. Right? But we've got to be like, you know, <laughs> we've got to take care of our musicians, especially now during the pandemic when performances um, are not right. the usual thing. So um, anyway, let's bring John back on. Everyone, you can go to John's website. It's johndurant.rocks. He's also on Bandcamp. And that's John with no H because he doesn't like H's. <laughs> I don't know, but John, welcome back. <laughs> okay. <Hello. laughs> so, you know, kick the H to the curb. <laughs> huh? <laughs> it's good to have you back on the show. Um, also, I want to welcome Peter. Uh, Peter's website is peterchilvers.com. And he's also on Bandcamp. Peter, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Despite the okay. lockdown and diseases circulating around the house. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you, you gotta you gotta be careful out in England. Apparently you guys are yeah, like you're in double quarantine now. Over there. Yeah, it's not good. It's um mm. I uh, I think we've got a couple of weeks before it starts to calm down again. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Wow, I'm hmm. Yeah, it's wow. horrifying. Sorry to hear that. No, I believe I had your John, fair share um, over there as well. So it's, uh, the pandemic's the gift that keeps yeah. giving, really. Yeah, yeah. it is. Well, it does. It, it, Would it be bad to say to some people I'd like to send it to? <laughs> okay, yeah. now, 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 we'll be nice. We're we'll trying to be nice today. Come on. <laughs> We're trying. Listen, it's Music Monday. John, tell me about how you met Peter and how this all started between you with, with this these two albums. Well, we had actually... Uh, we have known about each other for a long time and we've been, you know, friends online for a long time, but I hadn't met in person until the, what, the um, summer of 2019 when, you know, you could travel, mm. you know, and go places and do things. And, like and I, had gone, um, <laughs> I had gone to England. Um, well, the, let's see, I had gone to see King Crimson at the Royal Albert Hall. Mm. And then wow. while I was there, I was actually on my way to Estonia to do the record with Robert Gershendahl that came out last summer. Mm-hmm. And um, while I was there, um, a guitarist uh, named Mike Bearpark asked me to come and play on a record with his group Dark Room. And so when I went up to his place to do some recording, he said, oh, um, by the way, I'm having uh, getting together with some old friends from Cambridge University to have a have a pub night and Indian food. And I said, oh, great. I'll I'll be happy to join. And Peter was among them. Cool. Mm. And, and we ended up having, would you say it's the best Indian food ever? Peter, that... It's pretty high up there. It, wasn't yeah, it, was, it was one of those <laughs> um, yeah. shockingly good Indian food and, and um, just a really lovely evening and um, just made for such a an easy sort of, oh, finally we meet and, and in such nice circumstances. And um, from there... It was probably later that year, right? It was probably around December. I had this crazy idea for. Um, I started playing piano and running it through my guitar rig, and so, you know all the crazy noises I got out of my guitar. So I started doing that with piano, and so boy, this might be nice if I had a real piano player. And so mm-hmm. I contacted Peter, um, and he listened to uh, one of the pieces that I had done. It ended up becoming my album, Soul of a River. 
And he's like, no, there's nothing wrong with your piano playing, but let's work together. Let's do this. Let's, you know. And so um, that started, yeah, we started early in the year and then what sporadically you would have some time, I would have some time. And, and then in a flurry in, in the late uh, summer, early fall, we both found ourselves, you know, sort of completely focused on it. And, and what happened was that the album ended up becoming quite a bit longer than a full length album. And, and, we really liked the the last pieces that had come together and said, well, let's do an EP with these, which we put mm. out first, obviously, because that's what you do, isn't it? Put the last thing out first. Um, <laughs> yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, sure. I understand that. <laughs> you know, this is why you don't get a mathematician involved in the project. <laughs> yes. I count backwards. <laughs> yes. Now, anything backwards goes with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that so that was always Golden Sands, and then you came out with Vista, and it's interesting because I know in Vista you've got a song. The first song is Quarantine, right? But collaborating like this is really it's it's fascinating to me how that happens, especially not being in the same room. Uh, Peter, tell us a little bit about that process. I mean, and and we'll play always Autumn, so everybody can hear that. Um, and we have to say autumn because Peter doesn't say fall like we do in this country. <laughs> but, um, oh, no. Do you know, I hadn't thought about that when I named it. <laughs> I picked the title. It never occurred to me. I was um, asserting my Englishness on it. <laughs> well, hey, but it's, it feels to me very, like, it, having lived in the Southwest for so long, in the desert Southwest, now we're traveling full time, but to me, even the names of, of the songs it really reminds me of, the desert and even like just even age of steam could be like a mirage, you know, a desert mirage. And it's just, there's this, I don't know. It just, it reminds me of like going outside after a big thunderstorm, monsoon storm, just electric as can be right. And you go outside and all the water is glistening little dew drops and the desert comes to life. Like the next day you'll have, you'll have grass popping up and little toads hopping around. Um, but the desert comes, it just comes to life. And, it just, I don't know, to me, just kind of brought me back to the desert. All that, I don't know, there's a mystical element and in, in just that. Um, it's very nature side to me. But that's that's what it, you know, when, when you think about these instrumental albums um, and how it can come together. And you guys weren't even in the same room, right? So did you ever Zoom and, and like, play on Zoom together to do it? How did it work, Peter? <laughs> I think we we once did I think to chat, but um, we never played at the same time. It, it, it's very odd because I think at the end the album sounds like we were playing at the same time. But mm -hmm. it just um, what would often happen is I'd wake up in the morning and because I'm in England I've got a five hour head start on John, or maybe even an eight hour. Quite eight hour. Hour. Nanny, so, nanny. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to go first. It's, it's like um it's like a game of chess in that respect, but um. Take the balls on, but I, it meant I could um, I'd typically play something on the piano, whatever I felt like, and it always because I had in the back of my mind that something might fit John's. I left uh, um, John's playing. I left a bit more space than I usually might, and so I'd finish a piece and think, yeah, that works, and send it over to John. And then by the time I was just going to bed, I'd get an email back from John with the guitar part finished on it, and um, then wow. typically I'd then take that and adapt that again, and then John would adapt it, and we'd sort of bounce around but it it ended up sounding like it was real time even though it was um played over a sort of eight hour delay normally it's uh um it was a very nice way to work um hmm. and um and, and i have to say as far as especially a, a piece like always autumn because it almost felt fully formed when it first arrived to me and um Peter had just built this really wonderful, almost full presentation of what the, the piece might be. And so my, my job at that point was to really fill in the gaps and the holes and tie together um, his part with mine in a way that, that uh, flowed really naturally. Like, you know, the, the timing on it is such that, it's much easier um, when people work in studios. Most of the time they work 
with a click track and you're, you're slaving to a tempo, right? And so you, everybody can one know where the, the first, first bar is, right? Everybody knows mm-hmm. where you line up. In this case, this music isn't done that way. And so we have to really work on figuring out where the ebbs and flows are and how we make those things work. And that's really the time consuming part um, because to, to do that in real time, right? You look at each other and you kind of nod your head, right? Um, mm. <laughs> to do mm. it over the yeah. internet was a little more daunting, but I thought the piece came out really well for that. Mm. Let's play it for everyone to hear because mm-hmm. they can hear your, the cloud guitar, but it's like, it's true. It's like your, your guitar floats in and out and around. It's like a little shroud that goes, it just weaves around. It's, it's super cool. <laughs> I know it's it's neat, and I do want to talk about this ECM music because it's something I, I, some folks may not remember that. And um, I know Brian uh, that that's uh, I was going uh, to say was Brian Eno right that got into that Peter. This is something you're into, or you played with Brian, but this is something that um, you've been into. It's something I was very into. Um, <laughs> it's quite odd the way I got into it, actually. I was um, very ill as a teenager uh, when I was about 13, and um, and I'd already playing the piano a lot. And the doctor who treated me at the time, um, when I told him I played the piano, he said, oh, you should check out Keith Jarrett. I think you might like him. And it um, absolutely changed my life. So I'm he, wow. also, I think, largely saved my life as well. So it was, it was, <laughs> he did well on that. Um, and, uh, hmm. yeah, it got me hooked on a lot which, of ECM. And- which, which one, Peter, did you start with? Cologne I think concert? it was a Cold Concert. So I started yeah. the absolute piece, I think. It's an incredible it's, album. Um, it's just shocking, isn't it? It's one of those mm. one of those moments where um, the original album is it's a two record set and it was all recorded live and it's all one long spontaneous improvisation. It's wow, cool. It's just truly remarkable. It's one of the one of the landmark records really in history. And um mm. Oh, cool. I have, I have no idea. I have no, this is the first time I'm like hearing about yeah. this and maybe I've heard it and just didn't know um, that I did stuff like that because you're on a journey. I mean, it's like, here's your magic carpet ride. And I can imagine being sick kind of ties in with now with this, you know, hiding from the virus. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. we're all kind of, you go nuts. I mean, Nancy, you, you were in bed for a full year when you were a kid. Yeah. And, um, and, and, I, oh. and I felt oh. like, I didn't feel like there, that there was anything wrong with me. And so every time I, my parents left, I would run around the house, jump outside, bounce on the trampoline, and then see the cars come in with the driveway. Uh-oh, run back in bed. And my mom would come in and like, you're all hot and sweaty. You have a fever. I'm like, oh, I feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> you need it Sorry, mom. and something to do. Like I used to get bronchitis as a kid, like a lot. And, Especially when we lived in England, <laughs> your weather and 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 my mm-hmm. my lungs didn't get along very well. But it, yeah, it does that. Thing. Mm-hmm. When you're trapped in, when you're trapped in there, you that's how I had to get real creative. Like I made my own board games and stuff. Like I yeah, got, I you know I'd play like Scrabble and play like another person's hand and do all kinds of weird stuff. But I can imagine music uh, for you, Peter, being something that. I mean that it sets you on your path then, right? As as a musician today, from that. It did. Well, what was really odd actually, because what Keith Jarrett does is he turns up on a empty on a yeah empty stage with no idea of what he's going to play and just sits down and then suddenly the entire concert comes out. Wow. And um, while I won't for a second claim to have a fraction of his skill, that's also what I do. I um, uh, I improvise. <laughs> But at the time, until I'd spoken to my doctor, I had no idea that was a thing people did. It was um, it was such a revelation that it, that other people did this thing, and it had a name, which was improvisation. And I I just didn't know. And um, mm. so yeah, it suddenly um, it really did set me on a path there. It, um, wow! I'm very grateful for that recommendation. Um, I'm gonna have to go was... find this. I'm gonna have to go dig mm. this up and, yeah. and, and take a I'll, listen. I'll that... send you a link. You're gonna love awesome. it. I promise. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. I dig this. And this, you know, yeah. these two albums, I think, are so beautiful. And, you know, I have my own thing of this is a Southwest Desert. Somebody else could say it's something else. Everybody has their mm-hmm. interpretation and feeling of music. But it's something that, you know, listening to John's music over the last few years and him coming on the show, 
every time I listen, I hear something else or, or I feel something <laughs> different or it's very visual. And I love music like that because it allows you as a listener to either, you know, just go on a journey that you can relax. You don't feel like, I don't know, some music makes you work. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And this music doesn't yes, make do. you work. Mm-hmm. And it just, you want to stretch for some reason. I just feel like I need to do yoga or something, but nobody wants me to do that because <laughs> no one wants to see me do downward dog. Anybody's going to run. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> But, but it's beautiful. So get let's, let's, me, so come on. I know. Let's play it's Always fair. Autumn. So here it is. Before I get myself <laughs> into trouble, here it is. Always Autumn again, everyone. Uh, this is off of the album Always Golden Sands, the EP. And you can get it on Bandcamp, uh, again, through Peter Shulvers and John Durant, John with no H. So here it is, Always Autumn. <laughs>
You're listening to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa, and you just heard Always Autumn. It is the first track off of the EP, Always Golden Sands, by John Durant and Peter Chilvers. And Peter's over in England. John, where are you today? I'm in Portland today. Okay. Cool, Oregon, okay. That is. Peter, where are you in England? Yeah, Portland, Oregon. I'm yeah. in Ely. Where are you, Peter? Is, yes, just near Cambridge. Um, so on the okay. east coast, very, very, very hmm. flat bit of um, Ely. Uh, England. Um, although weirdly, I've hmm. been um, because we're in lockdown here. Um, I, I started playing American Truck Simulator, and um, it's this fantastically <laughs> slow zooming game where you just ride drive these um, huge trucks across America. And oddly, I'm um, last night I was um, driving a shipment of milk up to uh, Portland. So uh, I'll, oh, I should pop in and say hello to John. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> It is. I know it sounds mad, but it is actually one of the was... nicest ways to listen to music. It's, um, so I tend to turn all the sound off the game mm. and just um, drive through endless countryside listening to um, it was uh, uh, Joni Mitchell's Hey Jira last night, and it was oh, yeah, a very nice yeah. way to um, unwind. And mm. I, I listen wow. to music with far more commitment than I usually do, actually. I'm embarrassed to say I'm a real fiddler normally, and I just uh, blether around messing with email and other such things. But when I'm playing this game, I'm doing next to nothing following the road ahead and enjoying the scenery and uh, enjoying an album. So uh, it's uh, wow, highly Wow, I wouldn't say that. Mm. Well, we, 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 I do cool. a lot of driving, though. I really do a ton of yes, driving. But I want to say <laughs> that, Peter, your new name is Postman Pat. And it's Black and White Cat. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I grew up in England a, a little bit when, you know, I, do, I, I remember that yes. cartoon. Um, yeah, Postman Pat. Mm-hmm. So are you, you near Norfolk, England there, like East Anglia area? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I awesome. did live in Norfolk awesome. for a little while. So um, it's a, a lovely part of the world, actually. Um, and uh, okay. I used to run a record label that was based right in Norwich in the middle of Norfolk. And um, really I, um, cool. I loved living there. Cool. Oh, wow. Very cool. We have our good friend, Glenn Burrows. He's our um, English expert, and he does family history, and, and he runs Norfolk Tours in Norfolk. And he's on our show like oh. every every month or two months, and mm-hmm. he takes people around East Anglia and England, but he, it takes them to um, places where their, you know, their ancestry is. So a lot of Americans going back over, because obviously we have a lot of British history, especially when John, when you're back in, you know, Massachusetts, you guys are like, you, you're full, you know, tons of English history there. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh, so yeah. a lot of people from the States, Canada, you know, Australia, South Africa will go over and he takes them around. It's pretty cool. So we've learned a lot about your area, which is beautiful. And we run a story series called the English Connection. So wherever we go, if we find English history, it'll tie back to Glen, to England. But no, normally it'll end up being Norfolk. And you've got a bunch of famous people. Like we discovered Abraham Lincoln's. Mm-hmm. We went to where his parents met in Springfield, oh, wow. Kentucky went to the cabins and everything where they were and then found out that Abraham Lincoln's, his, I think it's his father's, I can't remember the father or mother's side, but his ancestors come from Swanton Morley, which is in Norfolk. And so they're looking at becoming sister city. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's amazing. Like oh, all, cool. those, I've no idea about all, all mm, goes back cool. to, to, yeah, well, this is it. We're all connected. And I think Absolutely. one thing, John, that I love what you do 
is that you tend to go over, you know, across the pond even to England, you know, the Ukraine. Um, you you play with musicians around the world, and that's something, like, just even listening to the different music you've done, are you influenced by other countries for your playing? Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, I, mm. I, I listen to very little American music, to be honest with you. I mean, um, you know, to, to harken back to the, um, the ECM records thing, at the same sort of time that Peter was listening to Keith Jarrett, I was listening to a Norwegian guitarist named Terry Riptal, who uh, I would have been about 14 years old when I heard it. And this would have been 1978 when the, I was listening to a lot of jazz fusion music. And so mm-hmm. Al Dimiola was in, in fashion. Um, Alan Holdsworth had arrived. Um, John McLaughlin, people who played a ton of notes really fast. Mm-hmm. Right. And I got, I heard this guy making this music from the fjords. I mean, it's like this, cool. this unbelievable slowed down guitar with tone of the gods and just this expressiveness dripping out of it. And I said, I want to do that. I don't want to play a ton of notes. I want to play like this guy. And that started, that was my ECM introduction. And that started me down the same sort of path of, of improvisational music that didn't, revolve around playing a ton of notes but was much more sort of expressive and and wanted to to convey something really other than I'm a I'm a really good player you know mm. there's, there's a big difference between a player who's technically perfect and a player who plays from the heart the yes. big mm-hmm. big difference I won't mention names Lisa because I know you got mad at me <laughs> <laughs> We, we're not going to get like, an, anyone in trouble, but it's uh, Ned it's has a certain... does not like Clapton. No, <laughs> just to say right. that <laughs> you know, so it's now I'm going to versus versus playing from the heart. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah. I won't, It really is. So you can go listen to him, and you can say, "Yeah, I get it." <laughs> but anyway, but I want to say, Yvonne, that it's like to your to uh, yeah. Huh? As it is you know, Clapton. You did it. I didn't. Is, uh, I'm just saying, you know. I know. I, I'll, when we're there, driving, we, I'll put like obscure Clapton music on. I'll say, hey, what do you think about this? Thinking she <laughs> may go for it. And she'll go, I don't like him. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> she knows. I don't, and she's honestly, sorry. he's done a lot of good stuff. And sorry, Peter, he's from England. And he is a good, he is good at what he does. But everyone's got their thing. But you yeah. guys both play from your heart. And yeah, I, I'm you fascinated. Tell. You know, just the music, like always Autumn, to me, I would like to see both albums be part of like a dance, a dance pro- uh, production, dancers, <laughs> like just, you know, not necessarily ballet, but, you know, there's this modern, I don't dance. know. No, just it's really beautiful because I think that it's got, like I said, doing yoga, there's this beautiful stretching and observance of each note having a meaning. I'm having a, feet, you know what I mean? Each note has a place to breathe. Mm. Yeah, it's breathing. There is a, a really, especially that piece, there's such a flow to it. There's such a, mm. it, it, um, it really, uh, it moves in a way that is not in any way static. It's, um, it, it just kind of, it takes you along. And, and just when you think, okay, I'm really comfortable here, it moves you a little bit. And you have to and you have to re account for that and and think, okay, what's coming now? And uh, that moment where my guitar first comes in with all the sort of sparkly stuff around it um, has always been one of those things where Peter and I both just <laughs> felt like, yeah, that's the spot, right? That's where mm-hmm. that's where mm-hmm. the 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 piano part changed and that just comes in and it's like you suddenly have this moment of awakening, right? Um, you know, you were talking about the desert and the, and the you know, after the rain and how, mm-hmm. how everything sort of Im- immediately comes to life. And it's the first time I had thought about it in, this, in the context of this piece. But when it happened, as I was listening, as you were playing it, I said, boy, that's it exactly, isn't it? it yeah. Just, <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. But there's also, like, in my mind, when totally, because I always go nature, I always go animals, I feel like there's a raptor way high up. And Mm -hmm. it starts doing that circling that they do. Sure. And they come lower and lower. And then they stop flying. And they're just floating on the thermals. That's where my mm. mind went. I'm like, dude, I'm floating up there with some eagle. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, I've listened to it a few times, and like every time I listen, it changes. Like the first That's, time, always yeah. autumn, I went right to autumn. And in this year, Nancy and I were in St. Louis in a suburb, uh, Webster Grove. That's a historic neighborhood in. Um, that's actually a university church, university kind of neighborhood, um, a historic neighborhood, and. Um, this bed and breakfast was an old church. I'm just saying. And anyway, we went to this park, and John knows we sneak wine everywhere we go. Yeah. And by the way, this, I, I know, John, you like to drink whiskey with this. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to agree. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, but, but we have a little backpacks, our Puerto Vino backpacks, and we take our little wine in there, and no one knows. It, you know, it's totally discreet. Anyway, we went to this neighborhood park, and you know, we're from the desert, and so fall is some of the cactus get little yellowy things, and there are fall colors in the desert, but we experienced true mm. fall colors in oh, back, excuse me, last year, I should say, not this year. Um, yes. And it is absolutely it's amazing. Just, I, I can't, you, it's intoxicating. You're so, you, you almost just want to roll in the leaves, you know, and you just, mm-hmm. you, if you could eat the colors, you would. And these, we sat on this bench and people are jogging and walking their dogs and doing all the healthy things. We are sitting there drinking our wine and didn't move from this bench. All these leaves were swallowing down all these beautiful, huge, like maple really cool. leaves, and just all these different intense yellows and reds. And I'm like, this is the most magical thing as they're coming down. It's like you are in this thing that only happens this you know, few weeks in this place. And you're right in the in the part of it. And so the first time I heard always autumn, my mind went autumn immediately, but mm-hmm. just from the title, but listening to it, it just takes me back to sitting there. This was just a pure magical moment for me personally. So that I would I wish your music was playing there. You know, and I, I yeah. think <laughs> parks need music like this. Some some parks we should have that, you know, should play this mm-hmm. beautiful music. It would nature. it would make for a uh, you know, some you can go some places um, where they will have this sort of ambient music happening, and that would be a really that would be a wonderful application for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I want, because you yes. you would be able to experience it if you wanted to sit and listen, or you could just walk on by, and it would just sort of inform you as you're you know. As you're as you're in process, without mm-hmm. without having to force you to sit and listen. Yeah, exactly. That, it's such a, that thing, you, there's breathing in this music. That's the thing. It's mm-hmm. not forceful. It's, it allows you to be part of it, or as much or as, as. And the more you listen to it, the more layers come in. But then it's not over layered. And I think that is so. I know you guys talk about texture, and we've talked about that on the show before, John. Is the textured music? Mm-hmm. But it's like if mm-hmm. you're over textured you've lost the whole dynamic and this is so full of dynamic. I do want to go to what your instruments are because that also plays a huge role of what Peter, for you, are you, are you, tell us a little bit about what you played on, on both albums. Okay. Um, I'm using primarily, I'm using um, an electronic piano. It's um, some very clever people, <laughs> um, a company called Modart, they worked out a way of mathematically modeling the way a piano string behaves. Mm-hmm. So you could actually mm. kind of create yeah. your dream piano, set what length of strings are, how bouncy they are, how in tune it is. And um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time sort of finessing that and getting the right sound. Then admittedly, at the last minute, we replaced a lot of those actually. So um, <laughs> with a, a slightly different sound, it just, it's a really lovely instrument to play, but I didn't quite get it to sit right in the mix, so we changed it to a more sort of conventional piano sound. But um, I think hmm. I think Hamlet, that's got a sound that's slightly harp-like, slightly piano-like. Mm-hmm. It's, it's um, maybe a little bit like electric, an electric piano as well. And I really like these things that respond like the real instruments. They feel alive, but it depends how hard you hit it. 
it changes texture um, and you can really, you know, you can respond to it exactly as if it was an acoustic physical presence, but you can then make these quite extraordinary changes to it as well. Um, mm. I, I really like that. And primarily, this was a really nice chance for me to just play piano mostly and play it without thinking too much. <laughs> it's, um, um, which is why you get to leave a lot of spaces as well. So uh, it's, uh, it's not mm. too taxing playing that way either. Um, mm. That's, that's then on top of that, playing. I'd often add some textures as well. Sorry. I was, was going to say, it's, a, it's amazing about what the, the technology is now, because I remember Nancy and I used to both teach um, musical organs, and uh, <laughs> we taught retirees, and it was interesting about, like, all these organs. We, we did SD, um, and then there was a Lowry organs, Lowry. but certain ones were really good at the piano, and the piano I mean, it, and even on keyboards and, and electric pianos, like mm-hmm. Roland at one point, I think, was yeah. one of the top for getting the piano sound. But it, the piano is really hard to – that and the banjo. Stop it with banjo. <laughs> the banjo <laughs> on some of the things. But, but the that piano, to have key on that, the banjo itself. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing about when it was like keyboards or something, I, I would like miss the – the thickness of the keys like that that you know and so it's really nice to hear what you're saying mm. and, and to be able to hear that sound come in that it's just I always feel like piano is one of those hardest things you know when it comes to the electronic things hardest to capture the sound of it well one of the things about a piano is that um there's two components to it one is how loud you hit, how hard um, you hit the strings, and that changes mm-hmm. the texture quite significantly. But the main thing is when you have the sustain, all of those 88 strings resonate against each other. So you play an A, then all the other A's are kind of contributing to that. And um, some of the notes that are similar, like an E, they will also chime in a little bit. And you kind of hear them, they kind of all sort of oscillate back and forth. So you'll, as you hold down a piano chord, the sustain down, you'll hear different notes start to come out at different times and it sort of swells and rises and falls and it's a much more dynamic instrument mm. than is at first obvious and that's what electronic pianos historically didn't used to do I mean historically <laughs> in the 20 years ago since but um, in the last few years people have started to really get the hang of um, capturing that sort of resonance as well and you do feel like you're playing a real instrument it's um it, it's it's a great thing. I really love doing it, actually. Uh, so you can well, like to own a real grand piano. <laughs> when, when you play the keys, you can you know you can strike it hard or soft, and it responds that way. Yeah, and this is because uh, something about it's part of the nature of mathematical math, <laughs> mathematical modelling. It's not an easy one to say. Um, the it, it makes it much, much more responsive rather than with a sampled instrument. What typically happens if you play it soft, you'll get one sound. If you play it hard, you get a different sound. It's yeah, right. switching between, mm-hmm. say, 16 different samples. But with um, a mathematically modelled one, then um, there's a real richness to it. Um, mm. and you don't feel like you're playing the same note repeatedly. That's, uh, mm. um, cool. That's, that's I interesting. That. I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I, you know, it's, um, mm-hmm. it's just fascinating to me how it's going. I, we had... Dave Kersner on the show about a year ago, actually, and talking about how he's done all this recording of sampling, like all of these samplings. And, and, you know, it's almost like this library of sound that new musicians can pull into. And it's like, wow, that is so cool. It's just so hard. Like you want to run around and record everything that you hear, especially when you get into ethnic instruments, too, um, just so, so that those those sounds don't go away, because there's, you know, instruments all around the world that you just you you don't see you know on on the main typical stage and so to me it's like if we can capture those sounds especially tribal instruments I would love to see more of that because you may never see them you know uh, for and, and be available for that. Yes, but, and mm. certainly don't want the instruments themselves to go away. It's a that, that's a balance. You know, it's, yeah, it's it's almost the the one downside to it is that yes we can we can access these things and access these sounds and but but you don't want the real thing to go away and and mm-hmm. you know, because that's really that's such a huge part of of the tradition and history of music and how it how it comes about. So mm. you know, I, there's, yeah. your, there's your little. Your, your little balance that you have to try to strike, you know? Mm. I don't I don't think they'll go away because 
a lot of times keyboard players, they, they play the piano and the organ part really well. But mm-hmm. if they go to guitar, they play the guitar as if it was a piano because they're still on keys. And mm-hmm. they play the trumpet like a piano because right. it's still on keys. So that will mm-hmm. really mimic the sound of the particular instrument. So I think that a trumpet player will always be better than a trumpet on a keyboard unless the player's really, really good at it. I mean, But like, you got that bendy thing that you can do. Yeah, you got the bendy <laughs> thing. But... The bendy thing is there. <laughs> no, it's quite true. There's all the subtle nuance of any instrument that sort of um, you you just can't capture from a keyboard. It's yeah. um, so it's lucky for a sampled piano or a sampled organ that works absolutely great. But um, yeah. and picked guitar can work quite nicely actually, but mm. in finger picking. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you get into the thing that say John does, particularly with the fretless guitar, is there are any number of ways of playing a single note, and it's all mm. that control that goes into the fingertips. So important. Mm. And yeah. you just can't capture that on a piano. So, yeah, because fingers aren't breath um, either, you know? Fingers and, and mm. it's like a whole different, like, you know, if you think trumpet, you're breathing, right? So yeah. you're controlling mm-hmm. through that. Mm-hmm. And then fingers are fingers, even though guitar and piano is, you know, strings. It's just, it's fascinating because I also look at an organ is almost, because it's not strings, an organ is almost like a breath instrument because of the pipes, you know, yeah. so it's just, you know, the traditional, old school, traditional, you know, but um, it, going to back to the instruments with, with each of you, John, the fretless, like John has no rules. He has no little lines on his guitar saying you must put your fingers here. I mean, if they, if you were to like pick up fretless as the first instrument you played, well, you couldn't put the little dots hard. there, could you? <laughs> the little A, B. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, violin players, you know, grow up. Yeah, that way, that's so, true. Um, you know, I mean, to me, it, it what it really opens up is a whole other way of phrasing that um, conventional guitar you can't do, and um, it uh, it allows me to express things. In, in so it's funny in in a much more almost vocal sort of way, um, in mm. that I can really um, between using my my volume pedal to swell notes in. Um, there's a certain amount of, uh, of I, I really do. I try to breathe the notes the way a trumpet player might or a, or a sax player or, or even a singer for that matter, where, um, you know, I can really, I can, I can adjust pitch. I can adjust things in ways that you just can't do with a normal guitar. Mm, it's, it's, mm. it's neat to me, your music. You always go on Facebook and do little clips for us to hear you play and it's like this it's just magic it's magic and i'm so glad the two of you got together to do this do you see doing more like this uh, more productions together and because it's, um, it's an awesome project definitely cool yeah, I'm loving it. It'd be really awkward at this point if we said no, we'll never work again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really, that's it. Yeah, you know, it's like, that we're, that we're not working together anymore. It'd <laughs> no, be that's a very frosty interview for the rest of the evening, then. <laughs> that's it. It's like, no, they're, they're over. They, they left each other once, now it's over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's become a novella. But uh, if it, if it, I mean, it would be cool to see this performed live and then have like a like a dancer just kind of bend and flow with the music. I would love to wouldn't, see it live. You know? Wouldn't it be, be fascinating to, to, you know, have the concept of live performance? Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Once upon a time, this was a thing, right? Yeah. 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 What, you mean, what, what is interpreting Back in the dance. good old days when we were allowed out of our houses? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I I I would like to see it performed in a natural, just a beautiful nature setting, you know. Just, yeah. But also, do you see this kind of music being used in film? Mm-hmm. Well, that would be lovely. Yeah. And, yeah. and I can I can certainly see it. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to uh, get in touch and, and take it there, please do. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> It's one of my first ambitions was to be a soundtrack composer, actually, which I've never really um, sort of fulfilled. But um, I, I've kind of been near to soundtracks happening, but not quite been the one generating them so far. So um, maybe, I would love to hear some of the music used in film. Maybe you have to make your own film with your own music 
to... Well, I did the... actually start writing a script years ago, but then I discovered oh, I'm cool. not a script writer. <laughs> I got, oh. got about 100 well, words in and thought, am I going to need to work a bit harder on this? <laughs> well, just, you know, because then, you know, then, then it gives people the idea that you can't go there because otherwise you you have to keep knocking on people's doors and they're like, the first question is, well, how many have you done? And he's like, well, this first are like, okay, bye-bye. So make your first one. <laughs> Just a it doesn't have to be a big movie. It could just be a short thing, and then yeah, short and say here. Yeah. So yeah. I may build up slowly to superhero blockbusters then. So. Yeah, there it is. But I, but you know, independent film now is so much on the rise. We've been doing a lot of independent film interviews and and watching them, and really, yeah. it is the same thing so as discovering better. musicians that you don't know that aren't like always on mainstream radio and. It's just that it's a pure joy to see that this craft is it's it's quality, you know. And independent film, I don't know what happened with this word indie. A lot of people just kind of feel like it's not like Vanity Press. I mean, there's so much work goes into a film, so much work goes into an album. Um, I'm like you guys, this was something you did over a year. Um, so I just you know go like go like John and, and start investigating all these other places and uh, you know all these other musicians and books and authors it's so cool it's, uh, it's such a cool journey but going into just getting a geeky thing again um, you're sending files back and forth and doing something to them so let me get this straight because it's fascinating to me how you guys are working and I know musicians have been doing this a lot everywhere but so you put the piano part Peter, then you send it to John. Are you sending it like a wave or an MP3, and then John you put it through some kind of something mm-hmm. and add on? How does that work? Where you're merging it into one file? Well, what ends up happening is is you work in a in a computer program that for recording um, audio and and MIDI information and. Peter will send me a file, so there's one track, and I'll do my guitar parts, there's another track, you know, load up all mm. these tracks, and then one by one, you output each mm. individual track, send them back to the other person, he's now got eight tracks instead of the one that he started with, and he takes this bit he likes, and maybe he'll edit it and say, ooh, uh, if this goes here, I can I can move that, and... and um, mm. You know, so there's this whole back and forth. And then at the end, I, I take all the tracks in, and I did the, did the final mix myself. Wow. So, That's like a whole too. other thing. That's a whole yeah. other craft to be able yeah. to do that. I mean, it's one thing to be able to play guitar, piano, and compose, but then putting it into that whole other level and having this beautiful finished product, to be able to do that is I you know, that's where I'd go like dude no there's too many lines on the screen I'm out of here. <laughs> there are, it's funny I'm actually dealing with um uh I think our first interview was after one of my burnt belief records. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh-huh. Um and we're actually finally doing the fourth one and um oh. we're actually dealing with the drummer Vinny is one of those people. He's an amazing drummer. He has the, he's got the microphones and everything at his house, everything he needs, but he can't do it himself. Oh. He's, he's unlike, you know, Peter and I who have been doing this long enough that we're comfortable with it. Vinny can't do it. So hmm. he's had to have um, his sound engineer come down and work with him. But with COVID, wow. they're, they're not hmm. comfortable doing this. So we've been kind of... <laughs> Waiting and waiting and waiting and, you know, um, because, you know, you also can't go to like a studio these days and things like that, that are, you know, mm. it's just not. So, so, the, you know, we're, we're dealing with, um, yeah, yeah, it is mm-hmm. a challenge. There are people who are, who, you know, have learned to do it because they have to and others who just, like you just said, they're like, I, I gotta, no. It, it, <laughs> what it does for Vinny as a drummer, right? He's like, no, because I'm spending all my time thinking about the computer, and I'm just and I'm not just playing the drums. And and I get that. I totally get it. Um, mm. Yeah, COVID, COVID, you're gonna get COVID, you're gonna get angry drums. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're careful. Start taking I know it out drummers. On the drums. Like to, Drummers do interesting things with their drumsticks if they get upset. Yeah. I know yeah, that. You, you 
<laughs> don't no. be doing downward dog <laughs> yoga positions in front of any. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but but this 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 is interesting about COVID and it's a final question for each of you. I mean, I think it's been a very interesting thing and it's the same thing as a you know, filmmaking again, right? Not having this multi million dollar budget and then having to create something out of a very small budget. COVID has done that to all of us. It's not like it even recording's different. Maybe you guys would have been in a studio together and it just would have been an improv session, right? That would have been recorded and then added to and and but it's different and so everybody's I think COVID has pushed the creative envelope a little further than what it was before the pandemic I really do for for anybody in the creative arts and creative industry even businesses have had to use their creative brain uh, to stay open if they can or work completely differently so for each of you what do you think COVID has done in, in that positive light? You know, I know COVID sucks. People have died uh, around the world. It's a terrible, terrible uh, virus. Um, it's been just, it's been devastating. However, there's always something to be learned from these negative situations. So Peter, for you, what do you think you've got on a positive front in regards to creativity? There's been two things actually. Um, one is because I've spent a lot more time at home in the last year, it's given me a chance. Um, my other side of my life is writing um, computer software, mainly for my projects with Brian Eno, and they're quite experimental electronic ones. And it's given me a chance to take a long step back, work out what I'm doing, and try and work out ways to do that a lot better. It's quite a hard mm-hmm. thing to explain, but it's um, you know, a very nice way of just reappraising how I work and um, thinking about it. But the second thing is that I just don't think this album would have been the same album had it not been for COVID. I think had we met in a room, um, it might fall, I know, it would been a better album, but it wouldn't have been this album. I think we would have played differently if we were playing live. And I think because we were able to take a step back and sort of play, polish, change something, play, polish, change, and then keep adapting each other's work, I think this came probably a stronger and more calm record than it might otherwise have been. I think mm. you can afford to be a bit more adventurous when you know you've got the ability to just go back and change things if you need to. Whereas if mm. you're live in a room, there's a certain level of stress. That can be very productive as well. Um, but it tends to drive people to overplay a bit more. Um, mm. And when you're playing mm. on your own, yeah. you're not really always trying to impress somebody or <laughs> try and show off what you can do. So I think that's actually quite a useful thing. And I think that's driven the sound of this album a bit. I think it's... Um, and probably takes us a little bit closer to this ECM territory that I, I love so much. It's, um, there's a level of quite a level of restraint there, I think. Um, it gives awesome. it, once you've got that, it gives you a bit of a chance to um, let each note ring out and say what it needs to, rather than um, play a whole flurry of things. Yeah. That whole thing of cool. listening back, you know, to the good and the like. Oopsie, I shouldn't have done that, and then having to deal with that part and make things better. You have to put your ego aside, you know, of something mm. and, and be, you know, like truly listen. And, and that's the interesting thing as musicians, you're, you're creating and then you're performing, whether you're recording or not, it's still a performance, you know, when you're recording a piece, you're still doing that. And then, and it's a different performance if you're not, there's a different energy, right? If you're recording on your own in your own home studio, there's a different energy. And so to go back mm. and listen it is, it is a different energy, and and what's fascinating is it isn't. Uh, Peter was was right on with this. It's not necessarily better or worse. It's different. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and just you, different. And and one of the things is to learn how to make that different be its own um, positive entity in and of itself. Right. Um, I I think. I think this whole notion that this album, yeah, it would have been different if, if the two of us were, were in the studio at the same time doing this together. Yeah. I don't know. But, you know I don't know that it would have been better. And, and I look forward to doing that on the next one because it will be different from this one. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's something that's really important to me is to make sure everything, to do another record, I would like it to be different. Right. I wouldn't Ooh. want to do the same thing again. Would so, you be able to perform this album now that it's gone back and forth and it's been, you know, produced together this way? Would you be able to take the music now 
and perform it live together. Can you? I, I would. It would I would be different, so. wouldn't it? Yeah. It would be different. <laughs> Funny enough, I was going to say the opposite. I'm not sure. Could you repeat some of those things? I think. I think it would be a set of quite similar sounding tracks that weren't necessarily the same thing. Um, yeah. I think mm -hmm. probably Always Autumn is the only one that I think easily reproduced. It's quite. It's got quite defined the note. The sort of harmony structure and I think um, that the, and, and Hamlet could certainly both be be done, um, mm. and then the others would the others would be we'd have similar structure. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yes, and similar sound choices, yeah, I, I guess, as well. Yeah. I don't know if you can play the same song twice exactly the same way. Whether it's well, in the studio or live, I think there's always going to be, depending on your mood and your circumstances, mm -hmm. always going to be just a little bit different somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. It's certainly, that's that's always the case, and that's very true. But mm -hmm. it's particularly true when so much of what we do is improvisational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's sort of what's interesting about both of us as as improvisers is that we're both very much improvisation with an idea that a, that it, it's going to be a composition in the end, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, okay, I'm just going to blow now and, yeah. and off we go. This isn't jam, right? This isn't, you know, a bunch of guys getting together and jamming and, and throwing down some notes and, and okay, nice groove and all that. No, this is, you know, we're both focused on creating almost an instantaneous composition, if you will. It's, it's fascinating to me. I just, I want to see, you know, we've talked about this on other shows and, and maybe even with you, John, too, about there's something about like your style of music is I want to see people paint. I want to see people dance to it. I yeah, feel like there's sure. this other energy in there that allows that it's that breathing part, which is amazing because I always feel like live is more of that breathing, but now I'm thinking it's the other way around because live you're already, you're expending that energy as you're doing it. I know that sounds weird, <laughs> but, but it's no, but it is it's the, the, the difference. And a lot of people, a lot of musicians, especially when they first start recording struggle with this because there's this thing that happens live. And the idea is I want to capture that. And mm -hmm. it's, nearly impossible to do. Um, ultimately, they're two different mediums. And, and, and recording, making records um, is its own thing. And once you start to understand that, then you can really make that process work just as you can make live work. But the two aren't, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you it's like the difference between theatre and film. I think it's um, yeah. mm -hmm. it, when mm. you're doing a the theatrical production, you're having to project to the audience, you're having to react to um, lead to them and they laugh that sort of thing. But when you're making a film, you can do it scene by scene and really focus in on detail and make sure the lighting's correct. And there are all these extra bits of light and shade you can do. Um, mm. But still, go to the theatre. People still see film. They they each bring their own sort of um, quality to the um, proceedings. And um, mm. I think this approach to sort of non-live improvisation actually works better for recording. Whereas obviously if it's the two of us together in a room, well, it'd be very hard to play live without the two of us together in a room, really. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Well, well, I think the two of you really got there, you know. Yes. <laughs> but, but this is interesting. If you're in the same room, John would whip out his whiskey. <laughs> That's it, right? <laughs> so you said <laughs> What what were you drinking? You said sunset, you know, and, and I do want to go back to you, John, on, on COVID. Um, but I, I want to, before we go, touch on whiskey and Indian food, two things, two of my favorite things. Um, but, John, for COVID, what, what, is, what is your um, positive things and creativity that positive attributes this year, past year? You know, um, it's, it's actually been fascinating because I'm I'm in this really weird place where this was – by far the busiest musical year of my life. Wow. I mean, by far. And <laughs> part of it was that there were a handful of things that came up 
that wouldn't have come up on a uh, on a normal year where where somebody's off touring and they don't you know they they don't have time to do all the things that they would like to do now they suddenly have that time and they're like oh John let's do this and so mm. all these things kind of came out of it which were remarkable um, and mm. part of that too for me was that I was I was here in Portland I've been here now continuously for a year, which is unheard of for me because I, you know, normally I'm back and forth between the East coast and West coast. And, and technically, I mean, home is, is, is the East coast. And, and um, because of COVID, I got stuck here and uh, something happens to me out here that I, I have not been able to figure out, but I'm able to, focus much more on music whereas back east I, I have too many other distractions that take my brain away and so um, it's called being uh, cold I, oh, well <laughs> right or stinking hot I mean you know <laughs> the humidity in the summer is like, uh, so um, yeah so it was it was a really strange thing and it, it, it's just it's ended up being an incredibly productive time for me which I'm really happy about. That's cool. Um, mm-hmm. and one, of the, one of the really cool things for me with this record happening at the same time as I was working on um, some music with the Swiss guitarist Stefan Thelen, his music is much more intense. And, and so the, what I was doing for him, and actually we ended up doing two things together this year, um, which will come out, well, do, last year, right? We're in 2021 now. Come on. Yeah, right, right. yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> it's like this time thing, right? Um, so last year we did two records that are going to come out this year, and um, and that my playing on those is much more extroverted. Um, you know, I'm still I'm never going to be like a, a notey kind of guy, but but it's you know there's a lot more aggression and a lot more um, you know sort of progressive rock things that I might. Um, that I might do. And, and this album was almost like an antidote for me. This was much more of my introspective side. And I was really glad to have that because I, I, it's an aspect of, of music that I find, you know, we've talked about this before. I, mm-hmm. I just find when you start getting seriously introspective, um, the music to me be, becomes just much more, uh, a part of you, right? Mm. It's it's mm. much more of that sort of. Um, this is what I really want to say, <laughs> you know. Mm. As opposed to okay, I've got this. I've got this really cr- cool groove in fifteen eight, and I've got to play some some crazy noisy guitar over the top of it. Okay, I can do that. That's great. Um, mm. Now let me sit down and 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 breathe the notes a little more and, and, mm. and you know, and, um, yeah. You know, it's, and, it's, I, it's, and it's also it's, the interaction that he and I were able to get, you know, where, where he'll play a phrase and, and I'll pick up on, on that and, and follow it. And I, I really like that. It's just, it's part of music that, that really cool. is conversation to me. Well, I think what's really fascinating about the, the two albums in that it, it does have that breathability that we're talking about. It's like a stretching to music, right? And and it's got that stretch. But it, I mean, you, creating that is you're actually watching, walking a, like a, a, a tightrope of that because it could also be incredibly boring if you don't have some kind of energy and flow to it. And that's what's mm-hmm. fascinating to me that you have this breathability, but your breath returns. Where sometimes you hear music and it's like, okay, I'm going in an elevator and I don't care about this anymore. It's like, it's just there. Yours isn't doing that. You've there. I, I find that very fascinating to me because it really can. There's so much dynamic in it, yet it's flowing. It's calm music. The breathability is there, but you are still moving forward in listening. And I think that's a very hard thing to achieve in music is to that moving forward to keep people listening. But it has. Well, that. I hope so. I hope we have. Well, yeah. 
you know. It was certainly <laughs> what we were going for. So Yeah, no, I think it's just I just it's hard to do and have that balance and that and have the texture in there. It's just beautiful. So thank you both for joining us. Um, what's the whiskey, John, that you listen to sunset <laughs> with? Ah, uh, the whiskey. With the bourbon? Uh, that is in, that is in fact a, a Weller bourbon. Yes. Ah. Um, mm. the Weller special reserve. Um, cool. Personal favorite. Good. Okay. It's, it's actually, I need to try it. Yeah, I know. Me too. I'm like, it's, I'm... it's from the wrong part of the world. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have some Glendronic too. That works pretty well too. Hmm. Now this Indian food is very important. I I mean I grew <laughs> up on it and living in Kenya and South Africa and England too. England had Indian food. When we got to this yeah. country, like so I much. don't know what it is, but I can't even find a good samosa. You know, and yeah, I do want it. like. I, and I just, I really want good Indian food. I've had, I'm having a hard time with it, it's, finding it's, it. You know, <laughs> you need it's to a move hard thing in, yeah, it's a hard thing in America. <laughs> I, I, I'm really lucky back east. There's a phenomenal place just south of Boston. Um, and it's easily the best Indian I've, I've had in America. Hmm. And, and, but it is, it's hard and it's, and it's mm. it's it's one of those things that's very frustrating when it isn't what you want it to be. Yeah, mm. I get I get because it's just like a childhood food, you know. And and I mean that's got to be for you too, Peter. I mean Indian food is is part of English life to me. A good curry is very a good much curry. So. Yeah, well, I was quite surprised. I um, very near uh, Brand Studio where I often work. They um, I discovered a very nice Indian restaurant and I um, looked at the sort of note outside and it said they've been going since 1956 and um, wow. oh, incredible history. And it, it must, I think there was quite a, I don't know if explosion is the right word, but there were a lot of Indian restaurants around springing up around the fifties. And um, uh, I think in England and also in, sorry, around London and also in the North of England, there's a very strong Indian community. And, um, and it's kind of grown certain dishes, I think, have developed just there. I, I think Vindaloo is um, an Indian dish that only exists in England or has originated mm. from there, I believe. Could turn out to be wrong on that. But, um, but yeah, there was a lot of very good English um, restaurants. But it's funny, when John was describing the evening out, actually, that, of going to a pub for a few drinks and going for an Indian restaurant. And that's typically the really rowdy lads evening out at the pub followed by a curry at 11. So it's a, right. We weren't very yes. rowdy, I have to say. But, uh, we, <laughs> the the date, date, yeah. Pub, pub and Indian food, I think, ever. Well, it, it's, <laughs> that was what it was like in South Africa. You'd yeah. go out and, and you would, and it does get rowdy in South Africa. Sorry, but yeah, it's like it Australians, you know, South Africans and Australians, <laughs> we know how to get down, man. And, um, and so at the end of the evening, you did, you'd have, you'd have what, and I don't know if they make this in England now, I can't remember, but, and we were in the surfing area in, the, in Port Elizabeth and near Jeffrey's Bay, one of the top surfing places in the world. And they would have curry bunnies. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have curry bunnies. And then they would no. have what was called, oh, it is good. <laughs> and you'd have like. What is a curry with, bunny? Well, you it's take like a, a, you take a loaf like of a, bread. Like a shepherd, you, shepherd's loaf of bread, round loaf okay. of no. bread. Well, everyone's yeah. different. And you take the center out and you fill it full of curry or you can put chips. And I'm not talking but like potato chips. It's like French fries. But okay. French fries. Oh, okay. Eng- English chips are not the same as American French fries. It's like two different styles. No, they're different. They're totally different, different things. Yeah. Sloppy chips is what we used to call them. Sloppy chips. But, ah. um, yeah, well, that's, I don't know, I'm just South African. And so, you okay. put so, it in there. So, that so was what your you're, soakage. What you're describing is very much like the, um, like the clam chowder in a bread bowl in San Francisco. Ah, yes. That I have had. Okay. Right? Okay. Hmm. Except with, with the curry, right? Well, the, the curry bunny, and mm. I'm, I'm gonna. There's another. There's surfer child curry bunny, and I'm getting them all twirled around. But yeah. they, I mean, literally at the end of the evening, some places would do like the fancy bread, like you're talking about, like the bread bowl and all nice. Right. I'm talking about complete hangover food before you get the hangover food. Like at the end of the <laughs> evening, you need to soak up whatever you just did, 
and Pre-hand. it would be <laughs> they would cut the, yeah and it's like it could be a bun some of the stuff was deep fried like that but there was curry in it because you needed the spice already if you ate the spice before you went to bed you'll feel better in the morning it's like this anyway it's just go, I don't know all my South African friends are good that is not how it was because yeah, I don't really. know it was over 20 years ago but I really miss it I mean because you'd get like these I don't know. I missed that in a really good chip footy. Nobody knows what that is over here. <laughs> I'm like, I want a chip footy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Peter? Like a good chip I do, footy. indeed. I haven't had oh. one in a very long time, but yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily good for you. I know what you here. mean as well. That's the worst part. <laughs> yeah, see, that, it's so good. It's so good. And, and sometimes you can sneak bacon into your chip footy. Then Nancy will eat them, wow. you know. Yes. But there it is. Uh, There's no way you can. We always talk about food and booze when John comes on the show. So, Peter, sorry, we had to get you involved. There's no way. That's I mean, even when he said, like, how did you both meet? He starts, well, it's sorry, Indian restaurant. I'm like, here you go again. <laughs> it's like, never, never. But thank you both for joining us. Um, we're going to close with Hamlet. You kept talking about Hamlet. It keeps coming up in the conversation. So I figured we should close with that. And that is off of the album Vista. So everyone, again, uh, let me go through the albums. It's uh, You've got Always Golden Sands, it's three tracks, and then Vista is a full EP with five tracks. And um, you can get them both now. You can download them everywhere, but go to Bandcamp. They're nicer to musicians and paying them. And uh, you can go to johndurant.bandcamp.com or peterchilvers.bandcamp.com, also johndurant.rocks. John's got no H. PeterChilvers.com, and that's C-H-I-L-V-E-R-S-C. I'm just showing everyone I know how to spell. Um, I'll get everyone's names wrong during an interview and everything, but I can spell because I'm reading it. But also, uh, go get it. Uh, go get it on all your streaming devices, too. You can get it there or Bandcamp. And uh, we want to thank the National Parks Arts Foundation for partnering with us for this episode. They are awesome. And I hope that the two of you will do this one day. The, uh, the National Parks Arts Foundation uh, creates these amazing opportunities for artists of all mediums, whether you're a musician, a singer, songwriter, filmmaker, painter, potter. Uh, you apply to stay in a national park for a full month to create. It's very awesome. You could have your own island on Dry Tortugas National Park in the Florida Keys, your own island. Imagine like that. And yeah, you have two people. You <laughs> have to ha- it has to be a team. It has to be two people because it's so remote that if something happens to one, the other one can help them. And it's your own, you're off the grid, living on solar, and you have to take your food and everything. You've got a little room, and it is the most awesome once-in-a-lifetime experience. You could also go stay in a six-bedroom house that has a recording studio, by the way. And yes. it's uh, <laughs> right outside Hawaii Volcanoes National Park overlooking the ocean. I'm just saying. <laughs> there are some wow. places. There's Chaco Canyon right? in New mm-hmm. Mexico. So there, this is one of the coolest nonprofit organizations really connecting artists with nature and history. Uh, so go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org. Our first Friday show on Big Wind Radio is always dedicated to the artists uh, that go to the parks. It's always fascinating. Our next one will feature the founder, Tanya Ortega. She always comes on every year to give us an, a roundup of what are the opportunities for artists. So check us out again, nationalparksartsfoundation.org. Keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Thank you, guys. I hope you have a good whiskey or bourbon at the end of this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's time for you. Take care. Here it is, everyone. Hi, Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you.